Yes. All right. Well, I, th- I think we should get started officially then. And uh, Are we recording talk- now? I okay. just pressed record. Okay. okay. And we had discussed last week that Ed would introduce the chapter yeah. for us this week. And so I will invite you to do that, Ed, and then we can take the conversation wherever it will go after that. All right. I, I thought I would, uh, I would try to do this in a sensible manner. And I kind of like have three parts to this one. I'd kind of, kind of like to give a summary of what I think I read. Um, so we can maybe get on the same sheet of music as far as that's concerned. Then I have a few thoughts about what I think he's trying to do. And then maybe depending on how things uh, develop, I have a few remarks about what struck me most in my reading and we can take it, take it from there. So this, this uh, reading for this time was chapter six and the excursion six and seven. And it was about, um, I don't know exactly what the English translation is. Um, the literal translation in, from the German is soul space sharers, those who share your soul space. Hmm. So I don't, I don't know exactly what the, what, what the Eng- actual English is in that. Maybe somebody could throw that in. But it could also be soul sh- space partitions. That's also a possibility. The chap, the title in English is Soul Partitions. Okay, it's partitions. Subtitle, yeah. Angels Dash Twins Dash right. Double. Right. Okay, so we had twins, double ganger, and angels here as well. But I, I found there's a, there's a certain ambiguity in the, in the German there. But to tie, Thailand can either mean, it's one of those odd words. It's one of those ancient words. It can either mean to share or divide. So depending on how it is you're, you're thinking about it. It could be one or the other. It's, it's kind of like the, uh, that came up in one of our other conversations, the word soccer in uh, Latin can mean either curse or bless. It's the same. What, if you read the Old Testament, you know, once, once, once God shows up or Yahweh, you're probably in deep shit. You know? So that's why you always find prophets running away because they know what they're in for. <laughs> There's some there's some friends you're not sure you want to have. So at any rate, even they're gonna they're gonna help you out. So that and this Thailand has that same meaning. We only have the word cleave left in English, which is I think too bad because it kind of restricts us in in what we do. But anyway, um so he starts off in talking about the genius. And this was a uh, a Roman construct. He 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 cites some some old Roman and and when they celebrated their birthdays, apparently they celebrated their genius as well, because this is, this is that, that little spirit that sits on your shoulder. Originally, it was singular, later then divided into maybe plus and minus. It's very s- similar to what we would consider a conscience. Um, it, it, it was our constant companion. It was the, um, he describes it as uh, eventually as he goes through his discussion as the outer layer of the soul uh, itself. Um, he has a little d- bit of difficulty, I think, talking about this because he's talking about things that he actually doesn't believe in. So he's trying to describe how in this mythological world that we had notions that, ac- that accounted for these things. And, and this, this idea of a spirit that accompanies you is also the one that would infect places um, that we've talked about this in other discussions in the, in the Wallace Stevens poem where we think, you know, the house is haunted. Or if you go into a, if you go into a place uh, that's, that's, if you ever visit like Alcatraz, it's, I know the Californian would say it's got really bad vibes, but, but those vibes are there. It's that kind of thing. So, so we kind of leave an impression wherever we go. And according to what I've read here from Sloterdijk, um, that's actually what's doing it. It's this this genius that we have that's coming around. I found it interesting because I, you know, we associate genius with something very different um, as, as a particular kind of intellect or a very smart uh, person or whatnot. And it actually didn't get into the English language until about 1300 anyway. So it was very late in, in getting in. But at any rate, when he, he, he gets this also in relationship to the king, and so the king's genius then would be his spirit or his essence or his, 
his other his alter ego or however we want to describe that would that would infuse the space of the kingdom but it was at that point that it also kind of detached and became another if you will so that was the point where he was able to transition into other say metaphysical entities namely angels that can show up because they are another they are separate from the individual himself. They're not considered part of them. And there is also, um, he, he runs through this, this his angeology, which he derives from Mani, from Mani Kiism, which had a great influence on later religions, in particular on Christianity. Um, because it has a very dual nature. And so this whole idea of duality and dualness is kind of, I, I saw it as a theme that was running through this reading in particular. I mean, we found this in all the others. There were always two faces, there were two hearts, there were two whatever. There was the dyadic nature in the womb. There was the, the mitts that we had to talk with. So he has this two-ness that's always about whoever we are. And so he's carried that theme along, even though he's now, I think, moving out of the, the purely physical realm, which he has taken us through all the way from the beginning in the ever deeper, lower, more intense kind of pathway to something more, let's say, ephemeral or ethereal, more in that mental side of things, or as he put it, mythological. I mean, he, he very clearly says this is mythological language that we're using. And he also points out that we've, kind of, we've lost the ability to, to talk in those terms. He says categorically, we can't anymore. Um, maybe in the circles that he's in, you can't. I've always been in circles where you could. So that's one of those, those little places where I always stumble with him because he makes very categorical statements that, well, they, they might be true, but they're not absolutely or generally true. But that's beside the point. So anyhow, what he does is he takes us into these, this other realm and this otherness, especially with the angels. And the angels he then kind of makes one of his clever little shifts and gets them into being a mirror image of the person that they're talking to. And so out of that mirrorness, he, he derives the notion of a twin. And so then he moves into his discussions of twins. And I found it interesting that he first picked a pair of autistic, I'm going to call them that for lack of a better word, autistic twins who rather communicate with themselves than with anything outside of themselves. That was one example. And then the next example he takes are Siamese twins. And he leads us through this kind of freak show, show Floyd and Lloyd thing, where you have a pair of twins that would probably like to be able not to talk to each other, but can't because they're inseparably joined. And then in the end, at the end of the chapter, he moves into what I would call a virtual twinship, where he... He picks up on um, Musial's uh, Man Without uh, Characteristics novel, and there's a scene in there where he and his long lost sister recognize that they're some kind of soulmates. And so it's the, it's the incestuous relationship. It's the twin that you really can't have anything to do with, even though that's the, the one that you're, you're thinking. So he's always got a problematic interaction between the twos that he puts together here. So then an excurs or excursion or digression, I don't know what they're called in the, in the English text here, they're just called excourse, and which is entitled sphere mourning. This is that, 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 that sense of separation. We've lost all of this. Um, and so the consequence is that we as, as moderns more or less run around in a constant state of melancholy and depression because we don't know who to talk to anymore. We don't have those others. We've, we've lost them all. The culture has driven them away from us. But, but the cavalry comes galloping in with uh, Thomas Macho and his objects, because we can then use those since we can't use the others. We now have a vocabulary, at least of some kind, that we can use to, uh, to talk about these things and perhaps reconnect with this otherness that we have. And then in x 7, um, he actually gets into angels and idiots. And to be perfectly honest, I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, his, his, his notionality of angels is so far from anything that I've ever seen that I can't follow it. 
Um, he, he does make a quote. This is I'll, I'll bring this up because I the curb engine has to complain at some point. So let me get a little one off my chair. He brings this up that in the Bible, every time angels show up, there's always this fear not that is said. And in the and I don't know what he means when he means the Bible. Because I have I have a bunch of them on my shelf over here. And if I open them up, the Christian Bible, if that's the, what he's talking about, is composed of two parts, an Old Testament and New Testament. And this fear not thing never shows up in the Old Testament. It only shows up in the New Testament. And it practically only shows up in the Gospels. So the whole idea of what an angel was, let's say, within the Judaic tradition, had, had changed by this time. And at the time of the writing of the Gospels, there was a whole different understanding of what, what an angel was. Because in Hebrew itself, the word for angel is simply malach, which is a messenger. No more. If, if Saul the king sends somebody over to talk to, uh, to his commander-in-chief, he sends a messenger. If, um, if the, at the Battle of Thermopylae, if they have to go back and and tell the people, oh, we won the battle, they, they send a messenger. It's just the next best guy that can run the fastest and get the word there. So messengers are simply messengers. And, and I found it interesting that in the one time that he does mention, mention a story with angels, which is when Peter was in prison and miraculously is able to get out, the angel shows up and doesn't say fear not. So Peter thinks, well, that's just a dream. Pretty real dream. This reminded me a lot of John. John has real, very real dreams, you know, but this one actually got him out of prison. But, it, but he didn't show up with this fear or not. So those are those little inconsistencies that I always see that kind of kind of bug me when I'm reading. But I did not understand how he got from Dostoevsky and his idiot to angels and messengers not having messages. Because the whole purpose of an angel is to have a message. And in and in and there's a very rich let's say, angelological tradition in the West that he conveniently ignores, of course, because it doesn't fit into what he's doing. So, so what I found in this, this entire little get-together is that he has a very, very strong, I, at least this is the way I'm reading him, a very strong rejection of the idea of an individual self. That's we, probably a reaction to this enlightenment thing about the primar- primacy of self, but for him, a self always has to be have more than one part. It has to have at least two. But he also develops in Chapter 6 a little uh, structural framework for a five-pole configuration for how selves are put together. And the whole idea within this is to have the ability to communicate with these others who are as much of us as we are ourselves. So we don't have a self where more or less a conglomerate of at least two I'm getting because there's that here pole and the there pole and but those are abstract relationships when we look at what he's talking about it's always another it's the angel that I'm talking to it's the it's the one the Christ whose heart I'm exchanging it's the um, there's, there's always one other one that's always within this and then when we got, finally got to the womb it was us and the in the with um, the mit, as they, they, he says in German, um, that, that is the basis of that. So there's, there's this um, uh, lack of singularity or identity or uniformity or singularness, I guess, it, it is, is the way we could call it. And um, what else did I think, if I was thinking at all? Okay, and so our drive is to, is to always find a way to communicate. And to communicate with that with that other, so it's it's actually all about communication. Um, that was another thing that did show up in X Four Seven. Uh, he said modernity has uh, revealed itself as an information process. I'm not exactly sure what he means. I can read a lot into that myself, but I chose not to. Um, but um, I think I think he's trying very very um, seriously to develop an overall framework that allows for communication itself to be primary because that will allow him to take a media theoretical uh, approach to interpreting how it is that we need to understand who we are and how we, how we get along with one another. I, I, th- I think that's, that's at least that's the sense I'm getting right at the moment. So, 
that's that, that was my little intro spiel for what, what I got out of Sloterdijk um, this, this last two weeks. Hmm. That was excellent. Very good. I mean, comment just Thanks, generally uh, on the um, comprehensiveness of your um, presentation or your recounting of what you read and what you thought of it. I, I think a lot of it. I have um, six pages of notes that I've I put. I, I just don't sit and read them. I actually, I actually try. Um, Doesn't I don't succeed very often, but I actually try to understand what he's what he's saying. And I keep thinking back to what we've seen and what we've done before, because I'm looking for those motifs or those patterns that keep reoccurring. And, and this, this idea of inherent duality, uh, it also fits in very well with his, um, that was another thing I noticed in this, I didn't mention that. He uses the word sphere here a lot more than he did in the, in the last few chapters. So there was a whole time in there I'd mentioned in a couple of the earlier conversations where, well, where's his spheres if they're so important? But now they're coming back. Now that he's gotten out of that interiority or that very deep interiorness, we're starting to show up again, I think. Hmm. So, because he uses it a lot here. He also uses the word blaza about four or five times, which he hasn't done before. So, do I have anything else here? No. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Well, I, I can jump in there if so, unless someone else wants to jump in. Yep, go for it. Already there, John. Okay, I'm I'm sort of going in many different directions, um, and I'm trying to make some connections here with the text. Uh, I think he writes in a very elusive way. It's very suggestive. Um, mm -hmm. I'm reminded. I used to go to the Goethe House up on Fifth Avenue. It's a very plush, expensive place. Um, they used to have like wine parties with cheese and there would be a speaker or there'd be a little chamber music in the corner. And, you know, you just walk around and hop with people. And they were all very, very sophisticated and very intelligent people. And they spoke many languages. I always had a good time there. But it, it sort of reminds me, um, reading this chapter, it's a very uh, elusive sort of you're walking among several interesting speakers who are talking to each other and you spend a few moments with each little cluster and you hear a few conversational bits that are sort of like oh Kafka this and Kafka that and oh yeah I saw that Chekhov play wasn't that fabulous you know and that's the way I feel when I read this it's very like oh yeah uh, that triggers something you don't like Lacan well, let's let's do Dostoevsky for a while you know and I feel that there's something in each chapter that I've enjoyed and I think he's very eloquent on occasion and very witty, um, but also very dry. Um, and I don't get the feeling that he's necessarily himself depressed, even though he talks about people being depressed and anxious and everything like that. <clears throat> um, I, get he's, I feel like he's an older man, sort of settled in his ways. Um, he's, not a, just, he's not Dostoevsky or Nietzsche. These guys... They were like, he talks about Nietzsche having a voice that is, his uh, writing voice is definitely a tenor. And he compared himself also. He says, his, Schlotterdijk says his voice is a tenor voice, but it isn't a, it isn't a held in tenor. Mm -hmm. You know, he's definitely not a heroic tenor. He's a, I think a lyric singer, very light lyric, operetta sort of, um, maybe something Baroque, I don't know. But I just get this feeling that he's not, um, you know, he's not an angst-driven kind of guy. But I think my feeling is he's having trouble dealing with this, um, taking angels or demons seriously. But I think he tends to psychologicalize this uh, stuff and make it palatable to the modern mind. Um, and I find that um, I don't think this is what Gebser or... Uh, how can I say this? Okay, there's no enchantment when he's talking about angels. He's very, I do feel he's a little disenchanted. Hmm. Um, and I feel like there are other voices. Can I, for one thing, I think it's very difficult for the modern mind, and this is definitely true of Freud, less so of Jung, but it was very difficult for the modern mind to deal with the dream world or the magical or the mythical because they can't measure anything. 
you can't go into a dream and measure anything. You can't weigh anything because what would your instrument of measurement be? There is nothing in the dream world. There, there are no more, there, there is no perspectival capacity in the dream world. Um, everything's happening all at once. There's no clear boundary between anything. And you can't, and you know, if you walk into a dream room, you want to measure that door over there? Well, good luck, <laughs> because that door is going to turn into a window or turn into a path through a forest or whatever. So that's what I'm saying. These are enchanted worlds, and they're full of risk and hazard. Um, but that, that's why I, feel I find the modern mind is so inept when it goes into these realms. And when it does, it tends to get panicked. And um, so, you know, I'm very, I'm very at ease in these worlds. And I do feel like I have a rational capacity. And I, ha and I also know when I um, encounter things that are really weird, that I'm in, the, I'm in the world of qualities, not quantities. And I can't quantify anything here, but I can register, register a great deal from the waking world and from the world, uh, world views that I have uh, based on my capacity to take different perspectives. And I can bring that capacity into the dream world. You can also do this if you're in, uh, adept at trans states or whatever. You're doing it all the time when you go into a movie or a gallery. I mean, you're using these capacities. So I just feel that's my gripe is um, he's not taking... Uh, he's not taking these angels seriously. Um, and, and to take them seriously doesn't mean that you've slipped into the, the dark side of the magical mind. Um, and I don't think you should over, over psychologicalize them or interpret them either because they often don't talk too much. They have a very powerful presence and they can zap you. Hmm. They can zap you to hell. <laughs> you don't mess with these angels. And if they tell you to do something, you don't argue. <laughs> you know? I mean, I can ask questions, and I'm always surprised by the answers that I get. But I'm also aware that many angels don't. They speak other. They, they actually, it's more like a music. They communicate in a musical way. And it's a very much, and, and when they do speak, it's often languages that I can't understand. So I often have asked them to speak English so that I can remember what they're, what's going on so they can bring it back with me. So, and I don't think Schlatterdijk is this kind of a guy. I just really don't think he would take any of this very seriously. And that's fine with me. Um, you know, I, I admit I'm sort of a weirdo that I, these kinds of things fascinate me. Um, and I take them very seriously, but not too seriously. I'm also... You know, I try to keep my um, my wits about me. Um, I just wanted to read, and briefly, let me read this little poem, because I think this is a healthy um, Derek Walcott. It's a, a short poem. It's called Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your door in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes, peel your own image from the mirror, sit, feast on your life. To me, that's a very healthy self-love. And he's, um, and I think he's very charmed by himself and enchanted. And I also, and I'm also quoting Oscar Wilde. Self-love is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Also, I can quote Catherine Hepburn. I, I remember an interview with, towards the end of her life. She says, I've, you know, she was living alone. She lived not too far from where I live right now. And I knew a friend who used to visit her. And um, she said, I find myself absolutely fascinating. And I, I believed her, you know? <laughs> I think there's, and, I, and, I think these are, and I think these are very healthy expressions of self-love. And um, we should all be so lucky. Um, so I think he's sort of, 
I don't know where he is. I think mm-hmm. he's a very he's a very elusive writer. I feel I feel like he's very charming sometimes. I would not call him a warrior or a heroic character or someone who's fighting the good fight on behalf of others. <laughs> I don't think he's interested in that. I do. I, th- I think he has some. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's, ma- he's a magician. He's a wizard. Uh, mm-hmm. He can quote mm-hmm. lovers. I don't know how passionate mm-hmm. he is about lover lover relationships of his own, but um, you know, I, I just. You know, I, I, th- I think I think he's sort of been burned by romantics, by by romanticism. German romanticism went very sour for a long time there, and I think he sort of uh, has a, a problem with that. But I, uh, anyway, that's my two cents. I could say a whole lot more, but I would much rather hear you guys talk about this, and maybe I can chime in some more if, if something gets triggered. You have to, I have to apologize a little bit. It's very hot here. <laughs> I'm sort of, uh, I'm like perspiring and I'm, I got a nice breeze here, but I don't feel like I have all the connections going yet. So thank you. Uh, uh, The last time we spoke, uh, Wendy was about to say something when our (laughs) connection got suddenly cut off. So I would argue that that's uh, good grounds for you going next, Wendy. (laughs) Oh, yeah. That's how I got to do the intro this week, just so you know. It was that same spiel. <laughs> <laughs> good. You did good. Yeah, yeah he, he does. He does it yeah. real well. I have to admit, I, you know. <laughs> um, well, ironically, what I was going to say last week kind of does tie into what my thoughts about this week's reading was about. So last time when we were talking about the whole connection with like the placenta and the afterbirth and all of that, and that being a connected other and... Um, that used to provide nutrients, used to provide sustenance, and it was a constant companion while you were in the womb and all of that. And there was that quote by Andy Warhol that, um, you know, the outer sphere has now just been replaced by media. And the thinking of connections in terms of media, he fell in love with his tape recorder and decided that that was a new connection for him. And it offered something, some sort of sustenance that he couldn't get from somewhere else. Um, so when I read that in the last chapter, I thought, well, isn't that interesting? If you look around in modern days with all of us, you know, constantly going like this and looking at our devices and people who literally can't stand to be away from social media for longer than uh, 60 seconds, you know, it did cross my mind that we've recreated that umbilical cord and, you know, yes, it's wireless, but you still have a device now and it's still media and it still connects you to something. It connects you to other people virtually, and it connects you to some sort of an ether, you know, because it's all Wi-Fi and whatnot. And, you know, you can spend all kinds of time thinking about the way we've replaced, you know, whatever placental connection that we had with modern media. And that's kind of where I was at at the end of last chapter. Um, and so I was pleasantly surprised that around chapter, let's see, number page 462, when Andy Warhol comes back again. Mm. And, um, you know, he says the, acqui- the acquisition of my tape recorder really finished whatever emotional life I might have had. And I was glad to see it go because um, nothing will ever be a problem again. You know, now that he's connected back to his tape recorder and, you know, as long as he gets a good recording of something, he's happy. Um, so, I, again, I was just kind of I was pleasantly surprised to see that come back around. And he doesn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but it's an interesting thought experiment on how we've recreated this, this sphere and the use of media and different kinds of media to, you know, make up for um, this spirit or this presence that, you know, psychologically we're not allowed to talk about anymore. Um, So, but the other, I mean, the other thing that struck me during the reading was even as it was, he's talking about the angels and the twins and all that, it's always an other, it's always another outside presence. And there was another book I was reading recently that was talking about the soul. And for most people and most Christians that I know, when they talk about the soul, they kind of associate it with their heart or somewhere inside. So you, you, you withdraw in, you meditate in, you, you know, when you navel gaze, despite what Slaughter Dyke says, you know, it's inward and trying to find that inner connection. When Slaughter Dyke's talking about the other, and I'm thinking of this as an outside body, an outside entity, 
And this other book I was reading, you know, posited the theorem that the soul was actually an outside sphere. It was the air around you. It was your, you know, your vibrations. It was your energy. It was your um, vibes, you know, for lack of a better word, that kind of surrounded you. So it wasn't necessarily something was embodied within you. It surrounded you. Um, So then I was thinking about that. And at some point, Slaughter Dyke had made the comment about, you know, with this outer sphere, it served as a filter in a sense that it kept some things away from us um, in the world and the environment and, and things like that, let other things in. And, you know, I thought that was interesting because then the next logical thing is, well, if my soul and my other is really a sphere around me and everybody else this is too, then our souls are constantly bumping up against each other and so then what does another what parts of other people's souls and other people's energy comes through my barrier and what parts of mine go out through theirs um so that's you know that's what i kind of got out of this chapter was the idea like okay let's let's pretend or let's play around this idea that the soul really is outside of us and it's this other that's been with us forever um you know, what does that mean for, it'd be interesting to see if he addresses this again in the next chapter when he talks, or the next book, I think, when he talks about more um, groups and clusters of bubbles and not just this dyad of me with my other. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he brings this back up again, if there's this permeation between souls and permeation between others that allows certain things in and certain things out. So that's where I'm at. Mm-hmm. Cool. I would love to pick up on the theme of the tape recorder and media as a kind of exteriorization or dimension of soul and of the way in which that media, our media, functions as a... um, a kind of shadow self or some um, witness that we need to have in order to feel a connection to ourselves. Uh, that is not going to be the best way of articulating this, though. Uh, I, I, I read this chapter in a very sort of introspective and sort of first-person way and had an experience of it in my body kind of started there. You were saying, Wendy, about how people locate their soul in their body. And so I was paying attention to the just flow of sensations as I was reading. And as far as my approach to the text, allowing kind of, uh, allowing myself to be drawn in, you know, to that more interior feeling space. He talks about this as well as the soul is a felt thing before it's a seen thing. It's something, Mm -hmm. there's a sense of it. There's a feeling of it. That's a very vague term to sense something. What does that mean exactly? It's, it's not knowing exactly. It's not perceiving exactly. Uh, And he makes the point of saying that these objects, these pre objective objects, which are also pre-subjective objects, are more sensed first than, than perceived as distinct things or entities. And, and so the, the pattern for that is in the placental relationship because there isn't even, you know, that's minimum differentiation, minimum sense. Uh, and, and then the pattern gets, I, I think, in this chapter repeated at a higher, a higher order higher ontological order, it goes from a material sense of witness to a symbolic witness. He he talks about that shift as well. Wherever a material connection uh, is dissolved or is cut, it's replaced by a symbolic connection, he says. And so as I was reading, it occurred to me to ask a question, to ask myself a sort of hypothetical question, a real and a hypothetical question as a way of reading against the text or uh, reflecting on the text. 
and as a way, I think, of c- connecting to a conversation that Ed and I had about belief. Uh, because, you know, part of this is part of the story that Slaughter Dyke is telling is about uh, the ev- evolution or if not evolution, the transformations of belief, what we believe about who we are. And so the question I asked or the statement, it was rather a statement, um, is do I believe that I have a soul? So in other words, if I make the statement, I have a soul, do I believe that that's true? What, what does that statement mean? I have a soul. Mm-hmm. And I was reminded of an experience that I had, a few experiences I've had, which I think others could relate to, of feeling that one has lost one's soul. What, what, what does it mean to feel like you've lost your soul? Because if you've lost your soul, then you're still there. You're still presuming yourself existing. But then this essential part of you, which in some sense is really where you are or really what you're about, really the thing that animates you, he talks about the soul as the animating force, uh, is the genius perhaps uh, of yourself. Uh, That is lost in some way. You've sacrificed it. You've compromised it. uh, You have squandered it. Uh, you, you have in some way bet- even perhaps betrayed it or it's betrayed you. There's something broken about the relationship between you and your soul. Now, that's a narrative about the soul. And the question is, what do, I be- do I believe that? Do, what do I believe about that? Because it seems to be talking about pointing to something true But at the same time, from my critical analytical perspective, I can look at the concept of the soul and locate it in a mythological tradition and then locate that tradition in a sort of sociopolitical historical context and um, kind of objectify it and, you know, regard it as more of a, a myth or more of as a, an illusion than as pointing to something that's real, some real experience some real sense of something about myself that is not quite the same as myself it gets you know um sort of incestuous conceptually incestuous incestuous at i think at that level and what i think sloterdijk has been doing which ed you traced the the move the movement from these Prime, primary and primordial intimate embodied experiences through the into the symbolic and the sort of micro emergence of self it's almost like i mean metaphor that comes to mind right now it'd be like tra- it'd be like uh describing what happens in the first billionth of a second after the big bang it's like in the first you know micro moments after the emergence of a self what are the all you know the the sub the, 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 the subatomic particles and entities that are existing there, maybe only fleetingly, maybe only for, you know, a few nanoseconds before they get absorbed into some other structure or some other kind of entity. So I think that that's where we're at now in his sort of philosophy. We're at the first billionth of a second of the emergence of, of, a, sen- of a self. And, and from the beginning, we have to presume multiplicity. And we go from the multiplicity of the the fetus or the proto consciousness and the, the the womb environment space sphere and the mother and the placenta and now we're going to go out into these emergent poles of identity that he describes i think to me beautifully as an ensemble as a kind of music because it's something more which is appropriate because it's more something that's felt than that is perceived analytically and described in terms of a framework or a system. It's more of a felt flowing um, aesthetic experience. And so I, I, I began to see some potential usefulness there uh, because what is happening as all of these different reflections of the self or partitions, differentiations of the self emerge is that, that we have patterns of how they function in relation to each other. So, there is a self, there is some double of the self that is a, 
is a guardian, is an inspirer, is a constant presence, is always there just for you, right? Your personal Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the kind of yonder of other selves who are friendly, but still strangers. There's the mother, the father. I mean, specifically, baby, mother, father, sibling, friends, and then others. And they're also situated in spatial terms between, between a here, a there, and a yonder. And one just footnote on that. Uh, in Spanish, we have three locational sort of, um, what, I don't know, what's the part of the speech of this? Uh, adverbs. Adverbs. So you have aquí, mm -hmm. allí, and allá. Uh -huh. Here, it's not just here and yonder. That's, I think, yeah. a translational issue. Here, there, and here, there, and yonder. So there is really close. There is within reach. Yonder is beyond that, that boundary. Uh, and I, I, I think that part of what Sloterdijk is paying very close attention to is this process of sphere formation, the ways in which these ensembles sort of arise between people, and I and the ways in which perhaps one pattern that one might emerge from this is the way in which groups and even larger groups perhaps recapitulate the functions that first emerge in these primary relationships and how those functions remain necessary even if the particular mythologies or languages that we might use to articulate them become discredited. So if we don't have a way of Inc including them and folding them in our world and in our worldview, the function, the need for the function still remains. We still need a genius. We still need a soul, even if we don't call it that. But if, if, if our ontology is based upon um, a conception that fundamentally divides us from a soul or from others in our basic constitution, in fundamentally describing or presuming who we are, then we're going to be kind of in this, you know, fucked position that I think Sloterdijk is writing out of, which is the pure nihilism Ed, that you, you and I discussed uh, at another time. And uh, I, I think he's, uh, I think he's, that, that's the space he's really coming out of. And that's the space he's really dealing with. And that's European literary, philosophical, cultural space. It's not all space. And maybe some, some things you get annoyed by, Ed, or the, the sort of pres certain Eurocentric presumptions that are sometimes still here, kind of subtle in, the, in this text. Um, and, you know, a lot of people don't have a problem talking mythologically, talking, just, you know, saying that they have a soul. It's not mm -hmm. problematic necessarily uh, to do that. It's become problematic, you know, because of Freud and Lacan and, you know, this, this whole... Uh, post-metaphysical, yeah, or anti-metaphysical uh, movement. So anyway, I mean, that's just some, my, my riff on it. Uh, there's a number of other things I think I'd touch on too, because like, the media piece is, I thought, really important. Like the way in which media becomes a sort of place where we play out, perhaps, or fulfill these primary functions. Uh, and something at once charming, uh, sad, horrifying, and um, amusing about Andy Warhol's thing, like that the, the tape recorder, the, the thing, the technology becomes what you have a relationship with rather than the people who are using the technology, right? So that, that's, I think, an interesting... I'll, I'll end there. I, I just wanted to add... Um, since Andy Warhol comes up here a lot, Andy War Warhol is from Pittsburgh, and mm -hmm. that's where I come from. <laughs> so, uh, so. I, I, ha, have you been to the museum, the Andy Warhol there's, museum? There's something, yeah, there's something in the water there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Especially when the two of us were growing up because it was all steel and it was all polluted, yeah. okay? But, but um, I, I only mention that because other people went through that and, and got completely different views of how to Kenneth Burke, for example, a literary critic, is also from Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And he has a whole different take on how this all fits together than, than Warhol does, for example. Now, what I think what Warhol did do, and, and, and I think it's a very important theme in what 
Slaughter Dyke is talking about. And, and it, it is this media, it is this media based connectivity somehow, whether it's a replacement, whether it's an azatz, whether it's whatever it is, it is, it is a reality that we are, that we deal with these days. Um, for those of us who, who started very early in this technological development, I, I would maintain, and I've, I've encountered this with, with many others who were like online before there was an online, really, back in the old the days where you had to actually log into another computer somewhere using text commands and whatnot in order to download files and and the use groups were were places that you could meet to to discuss things with with other people. We we took I, I'm going to say that because I wasn't there when it began, but I was there when it became, let's say, real. I was in Silicon Valley when I think I had mentioned this one time when when 75% of all internet users lived within 10 miles of my house. <laughs> okay. It has now expanded, but the, the point was for us there, it was, it was never anything other than a tool. And one of the things that I have a problem with, and I have this with a lot of, let's say media theorists is that they, that they tend to absolutize the media to an extent that I don't think is appropriate because Media is never anything but a tool, but we can also let our tools, just like we let our machines, rule us or run over us or or dominate us or however that is. We can we can either you know I can either be the the master craftsman, the master of my tools, or I can let my tools master me. That's that's also possible. That's a real psychological possibility. That's all that's existed ever since we've had tools. And it hasn't changed just because those tools have become a little more ethereal and harder to, to put our fingers on. But for me, the principle has remained the same. And you have to understand what is my relationship to my tools. And I, and I agree with what, what has been said here. I don't think Sloterdijk says it as explicitly as he could, is that we've allowed these tools to dominate us. We, we have, we've done what Goethe untos, unto, un, the, 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 don't get these things mail order. They never fit. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what Gunther Anders, he talks about what he calls the Promethean shame. He said one of the problems with modern, one of the problems with modern man, humans, is that we, we feel shame in the presence of our technology. We actually, you know, Prometheus was the, the, the god that gave us fire. And, and we could use that. And we've done marvelous things because we can manipulate fire. But now we've got to this point where we actually think, and I know a lot of people who do this. I've had the discussions uh, for hours on end that my smartphone is smart. It's not. It never was. It's not even close to it now. And I don't care what the courts vials and the others want to rant about. We're not close. We're not close to it being smart. Yes, it can perform. I have to think about. I have to think about John's dream space. It can perform lightning fast, speed of light calculations. But it's like trying to measure the door. In my imagination, I can go through. It. There could be a door. It's now a window. It's now. It's now the portal to another universe. This this can't keep up. It can't do that. It's not anywhere near that because it's simply adding. That's all it's actually doing is adding. And that, to me, is the fascinating what's part of it all. Once you boil it down to its essence, the thing adds very fast. Oh, boy. Okay, well, I'm not the world's fastest adder, but I don't feel inferior because other people can solve addition problems quicker than me. I can do other things that they can't do. But it's, our rela it's the relationship that we place ourselves in in relation to our technology that matters and too many people these days and i think so that it does put his finger on in, in the wound there because they have nothing else right they they don't have anything that they can believe in and when you have nothing to believe in you're you are in a very sorry state it may be i believe in too many things i certainly don't feel that it's been hindering up till now and i can be as Good a melancholic as anyone else these days. 
<laughs> and, but I believe in a lot of things. And I, but I know this is what we also talk about. I know why I believe certain things. And I love it when people go, well, why do you believe that? Why do you think that? And I'm forced to sit there and explain to them. And that means actually putting it in terms that I think they will understand. And that's my beef with Slaughter Dyke. He never does that. He never puts it in terms that he thinks others will understand other than his own ilk. And he's afraid of his ilk. That's obvious to me. That's why I don't see him as the hero either. He's afraid of these people. He's always shying away from I find it wonderful how he, he'll rip Freud a new asshole every chance he gets. But boy, he'll pussyfoot around Jung like there was no tomorrow. Why does he do that? Well, can I, can I leap in there? Can I Somebody respond to that? Here. I'll have to talk longer. We don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, 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 you've, you've said a few things that really have triggered me. And I'm curious about, well, I feel like he's a very bourgeois academic. Um, I think he's got, a, a, you know, a good retirement plan. He, probably has a, he has a villa. I'm sure he has a couple of a villa somewhere, <laughs> you know. And, has, I, and I think well he has, I think he has an ivory tower kind of quality about him. And he has a long view of the past. <laughs> I don't think he, well, I, I don't think he's very friendly about the future. Uh, I think he's pretty gloomy about the future. And I just remember, and, and this Freudian stuff, Freud and Lacan, they were also very bourgeois people. And, you know, there's this old saying that uh, the rich get psychoanalysis, the poor get shock treatments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think we're, uh, you know, there are people who are severely depressed because they work for minimum wage. 40 hours a week, and they have no benefits. And that's not about self-esteem. Um, and I, I think the, um, the Freudian legacy is a very toxic one. And he was working with uh, certain kinds, of, and I'm sure that those, the people that he was working with, many of them were wealthy people. A lot of them were women. They had to wear corsets. They could not breathe. They had no power at all in their lives and sure they're fucking depressed or hysterical you know, i'd be hysterical too if i had to wear a corset and i had no power i mean so i think this over psychoanalyzing or psychologicalizing comes from people who have lots of time on their hands and someone else is is going to be making dinner and serving them and it's, it's a very it's, it's a world i think that's rapidly collapsing except for very few people at the top and i'm from the servant class i've taken care of the very very rich and they took care of me and i i'm you know very aware of that um how you approach somebody who's a member of the of the one percent you know um so i'm and i i don't see any of this going on in his text I think he's a very, uh, he looks at the past. He, he, and I'm interested in, and I think Freud did not like visionaries. It mm. wasn't something his culture supported, people who mm. fought outside of the box. They were pathologized and they ended up in straitjackets. I think now we've had the sexual revolution, the 60s, you know, the 80s and the 90s, and, we're, and I th don't know what's happening next, but I have a funny feeling, and Andy Warhol is a re very refreshing quotation. Because Andy Warhol was gay, he was very postmodern. He had a tremendous sense of comedy about what was going on around him. He was a hyper ironist. Um, but anyway, a brief a brief anecdote, and then I'll move on. Because I had a friend who uh, he was he was homosexual. He attempted suicide with a gun. He put it in his mouth. He pulled the trigger, and he lived. He survived. The bullet evidently missed everything important, but he had a, a he, he, he limped and he, he lost one eye, vision in one eye, and he lost his sense of smell, but his wits were there. But after he committed suicide, he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happened when he came out of the coma was his mother. You know, how could you do this to me? And she, um, you know, she funded his psychoanalysis. He saw, he saw a therapist three times a week, very traditional psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. She paid for it, but I happened to be his roommate. And um, I was watching what was going on in his life. And um, I just 
thought this is so weird. Uh, this, we're talking about 30, 40 years ago. Mm. And um, I was going, my, it was my first year of college and everyone was coming out. And um, people were feeling really good about themselves, pretty liberated. Um, but I think it's, um, and things have changed radically. But I think it's because we found different kinds of therapies and we've been looking at different ways of using altered states of consciousness. Um, we've also been uh, looking at uh, the future and how do we use our imaginations to create futures that we want to have. And these are, I think, um, maybe sort of American driven kind of things, kind of drives. Or definitely it's uh, something that you'll find among people who have been disenfranchised or thrown out of the village. You know, they, they either get very bitter and very angry and self-destructive or they uh, take charge and they resist and they fight back. So this is where I'm coming from. So when I read this text, I feel a little, you know, and his, his world weariness. <laughs> I go, oh, my God, this guy has it so easy compared to most people on this planet. And for him to wallow in this disenchantment just rubs me the wrong way. Um, but I'm not saying there isn't some old world charm about him. And mm -hmm. I do think there were some glorious things about uh, the, Euro the European culture that we should cherish. I happen to love a lot of it. Um, and I've read a lot of it. But I, I, I think there's a whole lot of it that we should let it die, you know? And I don't, and it, I still feel like he's propping himself up with all this per partitioning the, the sacred and the profane. <clears throat> in ways that I, I would partition it in a very different way. I would be drawing the lines in very different ways than he is. When I can figure out that he is drawing a line, I don't like where he's drawn it. <laughs> but it's not easy to tell where he's drawing his lines because yeah. he's so wrapped up in this ivory tower uh, sort of, you know, old world charm. And I like the guy. I'm not saying he doesn't have that um, magical quality to his writing. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm a, I'm just speaking from the lump and proletariat perspective <laughs> right now, which I consider myself a, a member of. And um, I'm very, uh, uh, I'm very tired of listening mm. to these kinds of, uh, we are above it all kind of mm. conversations. And I think he's, he's, he's prone to do that, that kind of detachment. Mm. Anyway. Mm. You look like you want to say something, Marco. I don't. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what it is. Uh, okay. Yeah, I wanted to. Def I mean, I, I got a, a weak impulse, a weak impulse to say something to the effect of "Yeah, but mm -hmm. here, listen to this beautiful passage" or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. No, he's got all. I, I agree. He does have all that. I don't think. I don't. I didn't take John's. John's. Uh, speech there is his, his, his contribution as, as, a, as a rejection of what he's doing. What, I think what we would all like, I know what I would, I would like a little more clarity, okay? But I would, I would, I simply, I admire people who, okay, he's a professor and he can be bourgeois, he can be all of that stuff. But every once in a while, I think it's necessary to simply grow a pair, stand up and say something. And I miss that from him. I think every philosopher, you know, you can think what you want about Nietzsche. But he stood up and said what he was thinking. And you can think what you want about someone like Jordan Peterson, but he'll stand up and tell you what he's thinking. And at least you know what you're dealing with. You, you can sit down and you can, you can figure out how do I position myself in relation to that? What, what has he said that, that makes me question things that I think and believe? And, and, and I miss that, I, I have to admit. Um, by a person who is allegedly writing some kind of a philosophy, some kind of philosophy. I want you to let me know where you're coming from. Why are you, why are you so hesitant to say that? I, I got the feeling we're, we're all talking about feelings. I'm a big fan of both affective and cognitive aspects of our, our learning and our being. I think that, you know, we can't ignore that. We've suppressed the affective side way too long and it doesn't get us anywhere. That's quite clear. But I think you can make the clear statement, we need to bring more of that into what we're doing and then move on and show perhaps ways that one can do that. 
Um, and so I just disra- derailed my own train of thought, and I'll have to leave it at that because I don't know where I was going with this. I think we should talk about the last excursus. The idiot. Okay. The one I didn't get? Let's talk about the idiot. <laughs> okay. I, I, well, we can talk. That, that's great. You want to go that way? Well, there's I also, think so because I think there's it, one of the. We don't have to go there immediately, but I think it relates to what to this persona that Sloterdijk might. He seems to have some. I mean, he dedicated the whole excursus to it, and there maybe there's something in the quality of the idiot that he's uh, recognizing in himself or articulating in 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 terms of how he even presents himself as a as as the idiot doesn't come out and say you know what John what did you want to. No, I I was just thinking as you were talking, uh, there are two things. I wanted to respond to what you were talking about previously, but I can go into the Dostoevsky and um, the idiot was a novel that he wrote about this prince, but he was, uh, everyone thought he was stupid because he, he had no snobbery. He hung out with poor people, rich people. He treated everyone as sort of, he was polite to everybody. So, you know, everyone thought there was something really wrong with him. (laughs) And I think that's what, then it's called the idiot, you know? Uh, I think it's a sort of comedy of, uh, comedy of manners, actually. And I think also there's, he doesn't reference this in Dostoevsky. I'm just thinking of um, Brothers Karamazov and uh, Hmm. remember those, those great dialogues with Christ and the, the, the the Inquisition, the the Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. Um, And definitely, Jesus doesn't, Christ doesn't say anything. He just lets the inquisitor talk. At the end of it, the, the inquisitor goes up and kisses him, the Judas kiss. Um, so I think those, the idiot and the Christ and the Karamazov, they're both idiot figures, or they're silent, or they just don't have that. Um, they're not too cognitive or uh, theory-driven or... Um, they're not driven to promote their egos necessarily. And they're mm-hmm. pretty undefended. Anyway, that's where I was coming. So I thought, well, I can see maybe this is a, something that, um, that the, I think the angel as the idiot, uh, he can sign off. He can sort of endorse this way of looking at, at, at angels in a way he couldn't with them. Um, um, anyway, that's what I was going to say uh, to your response. Um, to bringing up Dostoevsky. Hmm. Um, well, bringing up excurs or excursion or whatever. What did you say that it was? What do you call that? Ex- excursus. It's the last. It's the last section. He talks about. Dostoevsky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called an excurs in in uh, in German. It can also mean a digression. It's something that's off the beaten path, and, mm-hmm. and they they tend to be a little more for me interesting than a lot of the things he says in the chapter. But for me, the one line, the one line in, in that last section, in, in number seven, in, in digression seven or excursus seven, was the idiot is the angel without a message. Mm-hmm. That, that was the one line that jumped out at me, smacked me upside the head a couple of times, and that's where I'm going. I thought I was going to get through this without throwing the book, so I'm not throwing it. I'm going to set it down. Because right there, you, you lost me. Because you know nothing about angels. You know nothing <laughs> about these, these other things. You, you, you've completely, and this is the thing that aggravates, this is what gets my goat about him, is how willing he is to discount things with a wave of the hand <laughs> as absolutely worthless. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold yeah? on. Hold on a second. Because Wait. in your introduction, yes. Uh, the way that you framed your understanding of an angel yes. is that an angel is a messenger, starts out as yes. a messenger, right? doesn't yes. have to be a div- divine being. It could be from the king yes. to yes. You know, some addressee yes. in another part of the kingdom. Yes. The angel transmits the message. So right. there's a, a monarchical, uh, hierarchical, authoritarian type structure there. You have the, okay. the king, the messenger, the content of the message, and the recipient of the message, right? Yeah. Okay, so what I understand Sloterdijk to be saying here, and I think it's completely consistent with what, with your understanding or non-understanding of this, mm-hmm. I mean, however you conceive it, okay. is, I mean, he's coming from a post-metaphysical space. He's coming from a space which 
fundamentally questions the existence uh, and the legitimacy of that sender. Uh, that And therefore, it, the messenger has no message to deliver because there is not an absolute re, uh, self uh, or a um, transcendental reality uh, that's other than the manifest reality, fundamentally. So not having a message to deliver, the idiot has to embody some quality of transcendence that is immediate that's more immediate than the displaced or the um abstracted relationship between a sender a message and excuse me um, the, the, that yeah. has you know between yeah. the, the sender okay. the message and the messenger so it's like that framework which is i mean part of the critique of metaphysics is that it's associated with a socio-political history of uh absolutist uh, authoritarian types of oppression right so there is, a, there is a critique coming against that structure, against that fundamental pattern. And the idiot is the one who's able to open up a sort of larger sphere of experience or relationship because they're not, pretend, one, pretending to have a message from the king. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and two, because, because neither are they uh, fully identified with the particular goals of a separate ego. So, I mean, he, he says actually some very, I was surprised, um, mm-hmm. some very generous uh, things about this figure, this archetype or what have you of, of the idiot that gets articulated in Dostoevsky mm-hmm. and Nietzsche. And, and, is not, and we could think of modern examples like Forrest Gump comes to mind, for, as mm-hmm. per, the perfect idiot. The, he, everybody loves him. Some, he makes everybody happy. He, does, he doesn't have a particular agenda. Life's a box of chocolates. But mm-hmm. he basically makes people happy and he, and he softens the space. And there is a purpose, I think, to, to that figure. Uh, that yes, I, I agree. Sort of puts, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote because okay. this is, I found it pretty, I found it pretty, um, I was surprised, like I said. Uh, this is... On page uh, four seventy five of the um, of the English mm-hmm. translation, so um, he's talking about about Dostoevsky's, Dostoevsky's book. I haven't read the idiot, uh, read the, the Brothers Karamazov, but um, he's saying that uh, this idiot, the, this prince, is disregarded like pe- people think like he has nothing to say he doesn't have a message right he's not a person of imp- import the way an angel would be a person of import because by virtue of delivering the message from the absolute authority um but nonetheless the presence of prince mishkin is a trigger for all events that take place in his vicinity so he has this sort of auric effect you could say he decisively catalyzes the characters and fates of those who encounter him uh, it is precisely as a non-messenger that he solves the problem of access to the inside of his opponents with a method that no one can see through. Neither siren nor angel, he unlocks the ears of his conversational partners and their centers of mental activity. And I'll just skip a couple lines because he goes into the childlike, you know, maybe that's not the right word. Uh, it, the childlike has a heterodox meaning, he says. It could refer to the willingness to interact with others without asserting one's own self, instead keeping oneself available as the augmenter of others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just to, on the next page, in the presence of the idiot, harmless good-naturedness becomes transforming intensity. His mission is seemingly to have no message, but rather to create a closeness in which contoured subjects can dissolve their boundaries and remold themselves. Now, he says he's seemingly positive things, but in the end, he questions mm-hmm. this notion as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he draws on Nietzsche uh, to do so because Nietzsche saw the idiot as uh, a sort of um, a misshapen human being, mm-hmm. you know, one who, one who's cut off some yeah. certain essential qualities, maybe cut off a sense of agency, right? Cut off that sense of the heroic aspect, uh, mm-hmm. 
and re you know, retreated into a passivity, a, a powerful passivity, right? Because it, it draws people out of their shells, uh, but one that is in some way limited by its, um, by its, I guess, emphasis on, on pure spaciousness rather than on the agency within spaciousness. So, so he, 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 um, he says the idiotic savior would be one who did not lead his life as the main characters in his own story, but had rather exchanged places with his afterbirth in order to make space for its being in the world as itself. It kind of becomes the super placenta, you know, the placenta that everybody you know has lost. Um, uh, where was, uh, is this a pathological excess of loyalty, a case of prenatal nibelung loyalty? I didn't know what that means. A delirium of yoke and cushions in which the subject confuses itself with the archaic patron and spirit of closeness. Perhaps the idiot's wisdom lies in the fact that he descends to his intimate waste, the placental sister, in her forlornness. Would he rather continue her life for her than betray their common origins in a state of augmented floating together? All right, that's one of those... I mm. our senses. Unless you become like children, he's quoting the Bible. Perhaps Jesus would rather have said, unless you become like this idiotically friendly thing. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, oh, okay, ouch, right? That if, 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 um, that's why I think he missed it. Hmm. That's why, because if you, if you, we, if we think back what John said to us about Christ and the Inquisition, and if we look at the prince and this idiocracy, He's, they're not, neither one of them communicates a verbal message. That is true. But I, I want you guys to explain to me why they are not saying something. So they're communicating. Very clear yeah. And very, very important. These are people that have messages above messages, as far as I'm concerned. See, that's my interest. That's why I said he, he knows nothing about it. A drastic statement. I'll take that part back. But I think these people are uber communicating. And we're not getting it. You know, where's the problem? The problem's here. Not there. It's here. With us. Because they are. Because I've never seen an angel without a message. And here they are. They've, there's a message. And that may make them, by default, angels. If we take the, the converse of, of what we generally define them as. Because I, I believe that that, that we run into that all the time. I'm listening to John talk about one of his dream experiences, and I face palm and go, oh, that's what so-and-so was talking about 20 years ago. I got it. Well, John didn't say that, but he certainly communicated to my being that. So there was a message, and that's how I see messages. I don't see messages as strictly a sender-receiver channel thing. That's one very effective model. I don't argue that. And you can do lots with that, but I don't, I'm not sure that's the only one. Right. That's very interesting. That, that's, that's why I, I, I was reacting like I was. Because you know? I, I, I thought you were making my point. <laughs> but we, the, you know, we're also used to this information theory where there's a, yeah. a giver and a receiver and a code. And, yeah. you know, there's signal, there's noise, and there's a ratio that allows us to communicate. But I think there are other ways of communicating. And mm -hmm. to, uh, I remember listening to Wilbur talk about being able to differentiate between the pre-personal voices, mm -hmm. the personal voice, basically the, the ego, and the, you know, the trans person. And these are, sometimes angels, and I think he knows, it, angels are invisible, but they can, they can speak. Mm -hmm. And they can communicate, usually very directly. And I had one angel, he, he said to me, I was walking down, a, I was walking in the dark. I, w I became lucid. I saw this angelic form. I decided it was an angel. I am mm. aware that I'm making this decision, mm. that this entity is angelic. Just simply because of the way he looked. He was this beautiful guy, you know, this beautiful young man with the radiant glow. And I say, well, he looks like an angel to me, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to bow down. And he said, stand up. He wasn't interested in that. He pointed his finger straight into my third eye. And he went, he said, give up form. And he sent this electric shock that went all the way through my subtle body. And I disappeared into this black void. And then at, in the black void, I was like, uh oh, well, now what's happening? And I heard a voice, another voice, and it was a, it was 
and it was coming from above my head. And I found out other lucid dreamers had this experiences of voices coming from above their heads. Um, so I think there may be some sort of um, lucid dream phenomenology that, that I, I think that would be an interesting research project. Mm -hmm. But, um, and it told me some information about my personal past that I had to sort of, uh, and what was going to happen next had something to do with this relationship. Mm -hmm. And the whole lot, and my personal life fell apart after that. And I was like, oh shit, if I had not had that dream, I would have, I would really be depressed. <laughs> but I, mm -hmm. I wasn't happy about it, but at least I could put it in some kind of perspective. But I think this is, it's not like a super ego, an ego and an id, that sort of hydraulic metaphor that Freud made popular and still is very deep in our culture. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. even though everyone says we're all beyond Freud, we're not beyond Freud. We're still acting like there's an, an ego, a super ego, and an id, and arranged in a very hierarchical, hostile fashion. We're super egos on top, and the id, and the id's on the bottom. And I'm uh, coming from a different worldview, and I'm thinking much more fractally that a self-similar object, that the whole can repeat itself in the part. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I experienced a lot of these uh, visionary episodes as not um, top-down command. I'm the worm and there's the, you know, mm -hmm. these higher beings. I, I believe there's a, a, an affinity and a resonance and a deep, and it's going, and a communication that's going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Very much like, and also I, I think much more like we're all like nested, nests within nests, you know, very um, fractally. Uh, but I think that's a metaphor that we've only had last 20 years. Hmm. And I believe it's a very useful one. And I think our psychology needs to start drawing upon more relevant metaphors. Because I think the, the, a compelling future can come out of people who are thinking fractally compared to this, this worn out hydraulic metaphor. Um, and and positiv positivism, even though even positivists say it's bullshit. But we're all doing it. We're still doing it. <laughs> Scientism is, is the religion we're all like bowing down to. So it's my frustration because, you know, I'm easily labeled and dismissed by these people. Yeah. It's very easy to, to dismiss me. But I know that, you know, I know what they're doing is bullshit. I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put it into better words than that. <laughs> finesse it a little bit. Works for us, John. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. So, so we're all doing our best to, you know, find our, our voices yeah. and to deal with the complexity of our own personal lives. And, and I feel as a pragmatist, as a realist, and I think we spoke well about this uh, uh, the other day about, you know, we need a, uh, we need the, the dreamer, the visionary, we need the realist, we need the critic, we need to sit them all at the same table. And that creates a richness and a depth that we would not have if just one voice oh, dominated. So as a realist, I feel like a lot is being you know, left out um, because I feel like you know, there's a lot of injustice in the world. And I'm not saying that he needs to address all of that because mm -hmm. he doesn't. It's not his interest, I think, in doing that. But I think he's using some very, I thought there was a well-crafted metaphor about the, um, the family mind, the mother and the child, um, mm. and the invisible partner. The field is built up further. The figure of the father adds a fourth pole. Then the siblings, the unrelated persons are the fifth. So he's talking about a five-fold field. And this becomes, a, du a duet becomes a quintet. Mm -hmm. And I think this is helpful, extremely helpful. Um, and, this, and the quintet, the fifth, um, that fifth dimension would, would be society. Mm -hmm. So we're moving from a family mind, from mother, mother and child to a family mind, to a, a group and to larger groups. Ultimately, I guess we're dealing with, with species mind. I mean, human species and other species besides the human are in um, collision right now. And um, I just don't hear any of that echoing in this text. Um, and I think it's extremely, maybe it will happen in the next text. I mean, in the next uh, volume, I, I would think so. As you get into the macro, he's going to have to, I think, register the effects of global warming and how this is uh, getting acted out on the world stage right now. 
And that's where my interest is. You know, I want to get, okay, this stuff about the post-human, the transhuman, some of it's kind of crazy. Well, and, uh, and I don't media think, as well, right? I'm like, you yeah, know, and I don't think technology is going to save us, but technology is quite powerful and can do some wonderful things, like bringing us together. Like, this is the real mm-hmm. benefit yep. of the technology. So, you know, I, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just trying to coordinate head, heart, and gut here. <laughs> and, I, and I get a little, I get a gut response sometimes that this guy just doesn't have the same kind of, he's not exploring the same problem space that I have to explore mm-hmm. in order to, to function. I have to deal with problems that don't, aren't his. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have something to teach me. Yeah. I just have to abstract from it what's useful and, and ignore what's irrelevant. So, and I, you know, and that can change from chapter to chapter. Okay. So we're almost at the end of our scheduled time and thank you, uh, John and Ed and Wendy. And I want to make sure that before we finish, unlike last time we get to hear Wendy at least once more. <laughs> Please, of voices Wendy, save us. And shaping our media sphere. Oh, good Lord, don't ask me to and, say it. Um, and, and, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure what quite to say. You know, I guess I'm reading it more for, like I said, I'm trying to pull out the stuff that I think is relevant and applicable today to thinking about our souls and whether we have a consciousness that's carrying around with us um, and whether that's been suppressed by current psychological terminology, whether that's been suppressed or changed by certain religious iconography and, you know, terminology and dogma and things like that. Um, I just, you know, it's an interesting concept. It's an interesting concept that we've got a second person, like Marco said, it was like our own personal Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. who's kind of around to um, n- not say anything. I mean, interesting, you know, we've been talking a lot about messengers and, he, you know, Slaughter Dyke made the case in here that the, the this, outer soul, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really speak per se. Um, maybe there, we have a sense that it exists and there's other methods of communication that we've talked about. Um, but, you know, as you're kind of going along your day to day, you know, doing the dishes and walking the dog and, you know, dealing with life, it'd be interesting to think that you had somebody that was right next to you, kind of looking out for you, paying attention, like literally right there that you could kind of turn around to and sense and, you know, maybe have them point you point their finger and say, stop doing that. You know, <laughs> I would love that. I would love to have somebody say, stop doing that. You know, you, you're on the wrong path. Go this way. You know? Mm-hmm. So I would just leave it at that. Like maybe for the next two weeks while we're reading the next chapter, just pretend you've got this other little person sitting next to you. Um, encouraging you to keep going or telling you to just stop reading and move on. <laughs> hey Siri. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I mean, just that sense of having a person always with you. I mean, uh, it, I I just said, hey, Siri, and my phone, res- it just beeped. <laughs> so, I mean, isn't that actually where we're going? Like to having our I own person so. with Jesus all the time. And it's basically no. going to be our smartphone that, mm-hmm. have you ever seen the movie uh, Her? Uh, yes. That's essentially, right, The like having your own double yeah. with you all the time, always listening. Uh, mm-hmm. unobtrusive kind of just kind of your filter bubble your membrane uh, filtering your email making sure the spam doesn't get in and that you see the important messages uh, but but we do we need technology to do that to be connected I think we can be connected without I think many many people are already connected mm-hmm. to a field that's quite vast you can get lost in it it can be dangerous if there's no center there who can articulate a desired outcome like we've been talking about, and then you can receive feedback. Um, I think if you can do that, you will be using the technology mindfully uh, and in a way that's highly creative and maybe can contribute to the, your well-being and many others' well-being. But if you're using, I think, the technology just to, as another distraction, it, yeah, it's a distraction. Because most of it's bullshit. It is, I mean, most of the stuff that's coming through is like, you know, dumbo stuff. Yeah. You know? But that's all that they can handle at that moment. 
And there's, you know, those of us on these kinds of conversations are connected to that other field and connected to those other souls and stuff like that. They're, most of the people I deal with on a daily basis can't see past the own nose, their own nose on their faces mm-hmm. and their phones that are attached to their noses. They don't want to think deeply about an over school or some of this dogma and stuff like that. And Nietzsche and Dostoevsky, I could say those words until I'm blue in the face and nobody would know what I'm talking about. And I mean, I don't associate myself with stupid people. I just, you know, I go to Starbucks and I go to the grocery store and I walk the dog and, you know, the dog seems to know what these terms were more than some of the folks that I, I run into. And, you know, and they're making themselves stupider because they're looking at Facebook constantly and smiling kittens and, well, I've emoji. been addicted to it too. I, 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 all the emojis. Every, we have an emoji movie, really? Do we need an emoji movie? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see them just revealing the emoji movie. You know? we <laughs> but we can't even say, I love you anymore. You have to go, you know, oh, emoji with little hearts, you know? I'm yeah, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, that's and, and it's addictive. I, I mean, I've, I admit I've been addicted to it. You know, I had to get off Facebook about two months ago. And I, there is life after Facebook, I, I guarantee you. Yeah. It's so relaxing. It is. But you had the strength to do that. And a lot of people don't. They are now sucked into this. That is their connection. That is their lifeblood. And like what are we saying? If all of a sudden Facebook shut down tomorrow, let's say there just was a, oh. hey, you know what, guys, we got to reboot the server. We're shutting it all down. People would panic. They'd be bumping into walls. They would oh, be, God, they go they would, The entire world would be black <laughs> for but, five minutes. Until the but it'd be like, a, like in those horror movies where people are walking down the street like zombies. You know, they, it would be total pandemonium. But, oh, all right, but here, but even without Facebook, we would still be essentially living in a media sphere, and even people who are uh, not of the same economic prosperity or class as Peter Sloterdijk are living in in this global media sphere. Uh, they may just have text phones. They may not have iPhones. They may have flip phones instead of iPhones. Nonetheless, we're all connected to the same meta network. And that is where our lives are taken, much of our lives is taking place. Mm-hmm. And it's the future. Uh, it, you know, assuming no. there... There is not a glow, you know, climate cataclysm, comet. I mean, assuming human beings continue doing what we're doing, we are going to continue living. We're going to live more and more in a media sphere, in a mediated sphere. Apple, just to be very specific about it, is going to probably include, if the predictions are right, some form of augmented reality uh, Mm -hmm. technology in their next iPhone. Millions and millions of people are going to buy that. Uh, They're going to make billions of dollars on it, but you're going to have these overlays, these places where the virtual world, the media sphere is superimposed upon or blends in to the physical sphere. And yeah, we're not, we may not always be, we may do retreats, we may put the phone aside, et cetera, but it's essentially going to be, our, it is our reality. And, and I think that Sloterdijk is really speaking, I think he becomes relevant there. I think he becomes relevant, especially as a media theorist. Uh, and may not be as helpful in the sort of spiritual quest, um, but insofar as he's describing the contours of our mediated lives, uh, there is something important about what he has to say. If, if he's directing us to pay attention to the dynamics, the intimate dynamics of sphere formation. I'll give a quick example, personal example. Uh, I got annoyed at my, with my wife. Uh, this morning because I went, I had gotten up very early. I finished my reading and I went for walk the dog and I came back and I said, let me just rest. Let me go back to bed. And may, if I may not fall asleep, but I want to be in a, in a pure space, space of quietude. And she came into bed and took out her phone. <laughs> and uh, I just sat, lay, lay there for a minute how do I feel about this? And how do I word this? <laughs> really? <laughs> However you say it's going to be wrong. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> Honey, can you do me a favor? <laughs> but she got, she got tiffed, you know, she got miffed and she left. <laughs> and, um, and my dog was even there. My, my dog was there. I was petting my dog. It was, we had a little spherical sort of bliss mm-hmm. kind of happening. But the phone, from my perspective, in that moment, destroyed it. And from her perspective, she was, you know, connecting to her social life or her social sphere. And she was being quiet. Yeah. 
That was her. She was being quiet. I, I can relate. My husband does the same thing. Not to interrupt, but go ahead. I'm with you. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that, that, I, I, I had just been reading Slow Deck and I'd just been thinking about like how we construct our spaces and how important it is to have those membranes, actually. And even like to define what happens inside certain spaces. Like, anyway, this will get into marital issues, so I'm not going to go further mm-hmm. into it. But uh, uh, we do have to be like mindful and that's we right. may need to infuse mindfulness into our technology. Mm-hmm. We may need a mindful AI that does helps us live in this chaos, helps us live in a way that keeps all the bad stuff and all the crap we don't need to see at bay, keeps it yonder out there. Other and, people's crap. Yeah. My crap is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I have no trouble with my junk. There's yeah, no auto tweet my crap, but <laughs> why, why can't you, know, you filter shut out up? everyone no, else? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard. It's very hard. If you, I, I, I struggle with that a lot. So I'm trying to be compassionate. Um, but sometimes I have to turn to someone and say, would you please shut the fuck up? And they usually <laughs> do. They, they shut up. <laughs> but I also realize, hey, I don't like the way this feels. I just told someone to shut up. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's very rude behavior. So my super ego really beats me up afterwards. So it's very hard if you're living in a very crowded, densely packed, very busy city, especially in the summertime, um, you know, not to get curmudgeonly. Mm-hmm. And I'm not the only one. I see other people getting into spats. I feel comfortable with it. Perfect stranger. Yeah. <laughs> perfect strangers start, you know. And I also see people on their bikes, you know, who are, who are text messaging. It's spooky, you know. I'm not that. I would never do that. But anyway, I, I see young people doing that. And I just, it just frightens me that they're going to get killed or someone's going to, or they're going to hurt somebody else. So I think we're going to find a way you know, to, to, uh, to make this technology work uh, because I think more and more people are getting fed up with some of the, the toxic, uh, some of the toxicity of it. Yeah. So, and so we can use it, the blessings that it could confer on, on people. It would be great. Um, but I'm worried about other things besides just uh, lo- look at, what is this stuff, what do they call it, 3D, um, Printing. Where they can, 3D? Printing? 3, 3D printing. Mm-hmm. This could really change the world really rapidly if more people could have access to this. I think it's very expensive technology right now. Mm-hmm. Getting better. But, but, yeah. But then why would you leave your house if you could just stay home and, you know. Print cornflakes? <laughs> yeah. So I'm just <laughs> thinking those are the things that are going to be. And I understand in China, they, they already have a, you know, a smartphone for 25 bucks. I'm sure lots of people are going to be buying, you know, everyone on the planet will have a smartphone, but, you know, they won't what about smart. work, you know? Robot companions as well. Yeah, but so I, I just think about traditional well, ways of... Paper quarters. Yeah, and I think they're, you know, we, we, we may not need to uh, work for living the way we did. I mean, there'll be, if, if it'll be so cheap to make things and there won't be huge profits, I understand, mm-hmm. the way there have been, mm. um, there's just going to be a different kind of psychology that's going to be required. Um, I don't know. I'm not a millennial. I've just been listening mm. to people and they're just thinking about things differently from the way my generation has. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just as overwhelmed by the technology as anybody else, I, I don't know what's going to happen next, but it seems like this exponential kind of growth is kind of um, makes everything so obsolete so fast. I mean, it's obsolete within a few days. So why work hard on anything? If, 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 if to study something and master it will take years, why would you bother? I mean, that's a real, real question because it's everything's so available so easily. Um, I think it's easier to be a pastiche kind of personality, like I think um, Schlotterdijk is, because mm-hmm. he's this, you know, charming, affable kind of guy who knows a little bit about everything. Yeah, because and, he's uh, assuming somebody else is going to take the time to learn how it all works. Mm-hmm. He's writing on the. I'm just as lazy as anybody else. <laughs> I just go to Wikipedia and look up, look up stuff, you know. But um, 
I, I worry about, you know, depth and breadth and how do you uh, coordinate all this information and in any kind of meaningful way. And how do you, you know, stay so that you're just not slip, slipping and sliding on surfaces? So this is what I think is great about it. we're setting this book. It's really intense. We're getting together and having these conversations. So I think it's an antidote to uh, the kind of shallowness that I see a lot of. This is why I got a Facebook. I just got bored with it. Well, you don't have to. You don't have to be on technology to be shallow. And, and being shallow is not necessarily um, as bad as it's always made out to be. I, I say that because. Um, my sister-in-law, whom I love dearly, is not on Facebook, and she's one of the most shallow people I know. But she's also one of the most heartfelt and generous people I know, because she still treats people like people, and she still helps wherever she can. And when the power goes out, and I think, I think even I think the possibility is distinct in my own lifetime, but certainly within my my grandson's time, the power is going to go out. It will go out. At some time, point, it will. And we are going to be left with all these people who cannot exist without the power being on. And I, and I do believe there will be a lot of chaos, and I b- believe there will be a lot of pain and suffering. And, and that is the history of the human race up until now. We have never, ever, ever mastered our technology, ever. It has only ever worked to our greater disadvantage. Yes, there's little things in there. We all have toilets. We all have running water here in the West. Not the whole world does, but some of us do. And so there are those little things that we have and we go, oh, look how great and wonderful we are, but we don't have them for everyone. And so when the power does go out, there's going to be problems. And I, I, I think all the time, well, okay, well, how do I raise my grandchild or how do I try to influence my grandchild um, coming up in the world? to know that there is a life beyond power, electrical power, because that's the only power that we tend to recognize right now. And to me, this is a very very serious problem. Um, You can't talk to a lot of people about this. My my sister-in-law, her biggest complaint with me is, why do you always have to be so deep? (laughs) People tell me that. You know, why do you do that? You know, I'm just I'm just the bummer who brings her down. You know, and I try to avoid that when I'm around her. That's but, what my first girlfriend said to me. Yeah, yeah. I, I broke I, up. Very yeah, well, she isn't that. the first person that said it. But, <laughs> but she's the one that says it most often because, you know, she only lives a mile down the road. You know, so we see each other more often now. Um, and it's, and, and it, these are, for me, very existential things. And, and our relationship to the technology and our understanding of the technology, it is so difficult to get this in the minds of people. Her son, you know, who's 27, just finishing up his master's, you know, it's almost impossible to talk to the young man because he can only speak in, in what I would call digital technological manner. And, w- and when I try, you know, he's having, he was having problems writing a, a paper for one of his seminars. But when he sits down and talks to me, it takes about five minutes till he says, you know, why are you bothering me with all this detail? Just tell me how to do it. So yeah. we do have these, these things that are, that are not yet balanced out. You know, basic income for everyone is making large inroads into this, into this country and into Europe as a whole. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, we import people. The uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Here's a messenger. Oh, yeah, my sir, God. Sir, sir, sir. And she is an angel. You see, and this is the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. They I always see. do. But... Angels don't necessarily have to be good looking. They can be otherwise. I've had a few of those in my life too. <laughs> you have to take them for what they are, you know. But the point the point is we we have to learn how to deal with each other as human beings. You know, we are going to have less to do. We are going to have basic income. We are going to that that is that to me is more inevitable than we're all going to have smartphones. People are going to be working less and we still have to produce things and things still have to happen so that, that, so that life continues. It's not, it's not, we don't have a pretty free future in front of us because we're creating the problems that we are ignoring the solutions to at the same time. And, and, and that, that's the thing that, would, that keeps me up at night. It's why I don't have lucid dreams and only nightmares, I suppose. But, <laughs> you know, we, we, 
we need to think about this. And I am, I'm, I'm telling you, the power is going to go out. It's going to happen, and we are going to experience it. And I, you know, I, I should be one of those people who go, well, hope not my day, you know, but I'm going, I hope it isn't my day, <laughs> you know, because that's well, we've the had a, we, you know? We've had a few blackouts in Manhattan, not yeah. too recent, not yeah, too far. Have, yeah, I know. Yeah, we we've had know. like, I, we were blacked out for like three days. It yeah. was really interesting because uh, I mean, my friend, we got on top of the roof and we looked down and they had like uh, little candles in the street, you know, mm -hmm. and um, you would hear on the other rooftops, because, you know, there wasn't any music or anything, but yeah. people would start chanting, you know, and you start, oh, I remember, I remember, I said, what's that noise? And he said, what, what do you mean? I said, crickets. Mm -hmm. They were crickets. Crickets. Huh? I'd never heard a cricket in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. But when we had that blackout, I could hear yeah. crickets. <laughs> it, was, it was really scary, though, on the third day, you realized people were really at their, at the edge, and you really got the feeling there's going to be an eruption of violence. Mm -hmm. the, then the, the lights came on, you know, that. Mm -hmm. The air conditions were back. They had, you know, right. everything went back and everyone got back into their regular rhythm. But I've had a glimpse of that. Mm -hmm. Two or three times we've had blackouts. Mm -hmm. And I remember, what was it? Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I believe yeah. I lived below 14th Street. Everything between 42nd Street was blacked out and there was no um, internet. There was mm -hmm. no running water. Mm -hmm. I was stuck on the 34th floor with a, with a Parkins, a gentleman with Parkinson's disease. And um, we, he lived across the street from the hospital, but there was nothing I could do to get him 34 flights down mm -hmm. in, the, in a blackout if he had fallen and, and hurt himself or something like that. So it was really scary. No. That was in, the, in Hurricane Sandy a few years ago. Four or five years ago. Terribly unprepared. But I think you're right. I think we should be prepared, but we won't be prepared. Ooh, we weren't okay. prepared then. Ah, right before the lights went out, they said, don't worry about it. Yeah, it's, yeah. The hurricane's going to come and go. <laughs> don't worry about it. Five minutes later, the, the lights <laughs> went out. Okay. And I didn't fill up the tub with water. I didn't get prepared for any anything because yeah. I didn't. Yeah. They told me, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. I think you're right about that. We need when to the think power goes through. out, there will be a lot more time to read books. That, that's what I... <laughs> During the day. <laughs> During the day. You can't have any light. Bring a, can bring a candle and a, light, a lantern. You have a lantern with some kerosene in it, hopefully. Hmm. Oh, flashlight and batteries. Yeah. How many you got? How long it lasts? Yeah. All right. Well... Thank you all. Uh, I did get... I, I believe I have something to do in the house now. Right, Carmen? I guess you do. Yeah. The fun never Hello. stops. <laughs> Thank you all. Uh, Thank let me you. you, by the way. This is John. Hi. What's that's your name? Wendy. And that's Ed. You? Carmen. Carmen. No, tell them. It, Carmen. 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 Is that right? <laughs> Carmen? Uh, somebody should write an opera about her. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. All maybe right. We'll, we'll Google it. Yeah, we'll Google it. <laughs> all right. Um, as long as you yeah, later. So who's giving Thank you all. Call? That all was right. great. Thanks so much. Right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye now. Okay.